This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. It was August 7th, 1947. The US and the Empire of the Rising Sun were at war. The Battle of Midway confirmed the Americans' growing strength and the Japanese' willingness to fight to the bitter end. Petty Officer Saburo Sakai and his squad of Zero fighters had planned a surprise attack on the U.S. fleet that was on its way to support the amphibious assault at Guadalcanal and the surrounding islands. The legendary Japanese Zero still reigned supreme in the Pacific. America was left trying to figure out how to create an aircraft that was up to the challenge of picking up a fight, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, with the agile and lethal Zero. As Saburo Sakai and his squad approached Tulagi from above, his wingman spotted a lone group of American aircraft beneath them. The Japanese decided to attack. A swift move from behind would be enough to create havoc in the American formation. They wrongly assumed the enemy they were up against were U.S. Grumman F-4F fighters, an aircraft with no co-pilot. But they were in for a surprise. As the Zero formation approached rapidly from behind at full throttle, Sakai realized he had committed a terrible mistake. At 100 yards from the targets, he quickly realized he was not fighting against fighters, but something worse. Dive bombers with defensive armament. But it was too late to abort. A second later, the American formation opened fire from each bomber's tail gunner's position. The 30 caliber Browning machine guns tore apart the Japanese Zeros. The hunters scattered. As Sakai's cockpit exploded and he ejected, he had ample time to contemplate his error. He would live to remember the moment. The Zeros had picked a fight with the formation of US Douglas SBD Dauntlesses, otherwise known as slow but deadly. The dauntless, slow but deadly, was a hero of the Pacific, dealing crippling blows to the Imperial Japanese Navy. Now learn even more about the U.S. fight back following Pearl Harbor in the Magellan TV series World War II in the Pacific. Featuring HD color footage, this series tells the stories of the most famous World War II battles in the Pacific that took place on land, at sea, and in the air. Magellan TV is a new type of documentary streaming membership created by filmmakers that brings over 3,000 documentaries to all your devices. Visit try.magellantv.com slash dark skies or click the link in the description below to get a free one month trial. Magellan TV continues to add new and compelling documentaries in their war and military playlists, along with other feature genres, such as true crime, space, and ancient history. Support Dark Skies and check out Magellan TV with a one month free trial. Click on the link in the description below or visit try.magellantv.com slash dark skies today. Preliminary studies of dive bombing in the U.S. began as early as 1919, when the U.S. Marine Corps realized that a diving plane pointed at a target could make more accurate strikes. By the 1930s, both the Navy and the Marines had adopted dive bombing for various combat roles, but not everyone was convinced of this new way of bombing objectives. Many military aviators of the time only saw bombing in terms of large formations of massive planes scouted by other fighters. The standard strategy was dropping a colossal payload with the hope of some of those bombs hitting their targets effectively. However, the first years of World War II, especially in the Pacific theater, would prove that the victory against the Japanese positions would only be possible using dive bombers. In 1934, the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics began suggesting to U.S. aircraft companies to develop a new bomber type tailored for dive bombing and aircraft carrier usage. The competition for this new type of scout bomber received submissions from Brewster, Curtis, Grumman, Northrop, and other aircraft manufacturers. It is said that an earlier dive bombing demonstration of the Curtis F-11C2 Goshawk biplane 
inspired German Air Minister Ernst Udet, a former Hollywood stunt pilot, to develop the famous Ju-87 Stucke. Other sources indicate that the Germans had already tested the use of dive bombing by the Condor Legion during the Spanish Civil War and the long years of military cooperation with the USSR after the Great War. The Soviets used dive bombing to some extent as well, but it was the US that eventually made the greatest use of dive bombers during the Pacific Theater across its campaigns in Japanese-controlled territory. There, dive bombing proved remarkably successful against the heavily defended Japanese fortifications hidden in dense tropical jungles. During the competitions to produce the new Scout Bomber, Douglas Aircraft Company purchased Northrop Aviation's El Segundo, California factory. With this move, Douglas also acquired the successful BT program, which in 1936 launched into service the BT-1 and BT-2 dive bombers. The Douglas SBD Dauntless was born as an improved version of Northrop's BT-2. The BTs were characterized for being all-metal, low-wing monoplanes that helped the U.S. Navy and the USMC make the transition from biplanes to a new generation of aircraft. Ed Heinemann, one of the Northrop designers behind the BT and the future SBD Dauntless, wrote in his book Aircraft Design about the source of his inspiration for the new aircraft. He says, quote, One day when I was a young man just beginning to design airplanes, the great person who founded the company that bore his name, Donald Douglas, took me by the shoulder and taught me a lesson that was simple, though vital, to success. At the time, we were trying to generate business from the U.S. Navy. Navy planes take a beating, he said. They slam down on the carriers when they land and get roughed up by the unforgiving elements of the high seas. If we want the Navy to buy our airplanes, we must build them rugged. They have to take punishment and still work. Faithful to those words, Heinemann got to work on an improved version of the BT. The final result became an instant icon, easily identifiable for its new characteristics and its size. Although it was a two-man aircraft with a pilot and a gunner, the SBD was relatively small compared to other planes of similar capabilities. It had a wingspan of 41 feet and a length of 33 feet, with an empty weight of 6,404 pounds. The SBD did not incorporate folding wings to save deck and hangar space. Heinemann decided that a small, rounded wing was enough. By doing so, the SBD not just became lighter, but more sturdy and rugged than other planes. The aircraft's compact design made it small enough to house more than 30 into a single U.S. carrier. Heinemann also incorporated a sophisticated hydraulic system to extend and retract the landing gear flaps, replacing hand crank systems. It was a small detail that also increased the overall maneuverability of the SBD. Besides its size and short wings, the wing's perforated dive flaps were another element that made the SBD unique. These flaps were explicitly made for enhancing the dive bombing capabilities of the aircraft. Each flap had three inch perforations that allowed air to pass through, stabilizing the Dauntless and making it easier for target acquisition. When in a steep dive, the flaps would, quote, deploy upward and downward from the trailing edge of the wing to maintain a constant airspeed of 250 knots. The SBD-1 was equipped with a 1,000 horsepower Wright R-182032 radial engine. The latest prototype model, the SBD-6, would be fitted with a 1350 horsepower engine. Small changes were made between design iterations, focused mostly on increasing fuel capacity for adequate range. When it came to weaponry, the Dauntless was well equipped, with good offensive and defensive capabilities. A three-time sighting scope was incorporated into the SBD's control panel to increase the pilot's accuracy when firing and dropping the bomb load. 
The pilot had at his disposal two M250 caliber machine guns that fired through the propeller. The tail gunner seat was equipped with an aft-facing swivel mount for one M230 caliber machine gun. The M2 machine guns were downsized versions of the American Browning 1919 machine gun that were more compatible with the aircraft. The M2 had a smaller receiver and barrel that helped reduce the weapon weight to just 23 pounds. As the primary function of the Dauntless was bombing, it was equipped with underwing ordnance mounting points. It could carry two 100-pound bombs in outer wing pilings. At the center of the fuselage, a fork-shaped bomb displacing gear could take a bomb of up to 1,000 pounds. When this bomb was released, the bomb displacing gear would swing downward, avoiding any direct hit with the propeller. The original 1,000 horsepower Wright 1820 radial engine could move the SBD along at a 245 miles per hour top speed. When carrying a larger bomb load, performance and range diminished drastically, but the Dauntless managed to get the job done. Just like the founder of Douglas had told Heinemann before, U.S. Navy and Marine crews quickly fell in love with the SBD because it could take a beating, mostly because it felt rugged. It was nicknamed the Slow But Deadly Dauntless. In 1940, the Navy and the Marines began incorporating the Dauntless into their squadrons, replacing them as each new version came out. Both branches were in transition to the SBD-2 when the attack on Pearl Harbor happened on December 7th, 1941. The Douglas SBD joined the fray from day one. During the defense of Pearl Harbor, the SBDs suffered greatly, as they were the most numerous aircraft the U.S. had, and they were caught off guard. The Dauntless would be the tip of the spear aircraft to go in during the entire year of the war. It conducted offensive bombing raids in Midway and the Solomon Islands campaign. Its ruggedness was tested during each encounter with the Japanese. It proved to be worthy of Douglas and his concept of planes that could take a beating. Badly damaged and with enemies on its tail, pilots and gunners were able to complete their missions and survive thanks to the toughness of the SPDs. In 1942, the production of Dauntlesses was steady. Navy and Marine squadrons were full of SPDs. They quickly became the backbone of the Pacific Air Fleet. Although the Dauntless would continue to be used throughout the war, it would no longer occupy the throne it had when the war broke out. After 1942, the Dauntless was replaced by the poorer handling Curtis SB-2C Helldiver, the Grumman F-6F, and other new American aircraft. Nonetheless, the Dauntless and its pilots earned their place in the pantheon of legendary aircraft during the critical months following the attack on Pearl Harbor. Heinemann's legacy lived on with the Dauntless and its nickname, the Slow But Deadly. It pioneered American dive bombing techniques that gave the Japanese army a true taste of pure American firepower. And the aviators that piloted the Dauntless helped decisively change the tide of war. Mm -hmm. 